and I run ASVAB Domination. So anyone who is trying to get tutoring for their military career, um, I hope can assist with that. Uh, ASVABdomination.com. Fantastic. Paula Williams with ABCI. We help aviation companies sell more of their products and services. Yep. Ibid, except I do the back end stuff for her. She's a rock star. <laughs> Which is why you're in the dark. <laughs> Can you turn your lights on a little bit, John? Smart man. Yeah. Well, I can't turn up the lights the way it is right now. Okay. That's cool. Uh, Tyler Hall, Shrek Eagle Aviation. We're a startup uh, Part 145 maintenance facility in uh, New Mexico and uh, San Antonio, Texas. Well, I am the author of uh, Sticky Branding, and I run a strategy consulting firm called Sticky Branding. Nice. Very consistent. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Hal Stevens, um, president, owner, founder. I'll, I wear all hats for my company. It's just my wife and I. Uh, it's a consulting company, primarily with business jets from a technical standpoint, um, pre-purchase inspections, large maintenance events. Right now, I'm in... Gravenhurst, Ontario, overseeing an aircraft going through paint, stripping, and uh, repaint. Awesome. Nice to meet you all. Nice to meet you. Um, so uh, basically, we're just going to be talking about the book. Um, I think I'll let Jeremy kind of take it away. You wrote it. Uh, so it's, uh, it's a really good book. I really enjoyed the stories about you taking over the business and everything like that. Um, but if you want to give us a uh, kind of like a rough outline or, or what you thought of it. Sure. Well, um, as you probably got, got from the book, it was, when I wrote this book, it was really trying to answer that question of, I wish I had that when, and I've been revisiting this story a lot over the last year and a half of the pandemic, because everything took on a very different light in this last couple of years, which was. I grew up uh, in a family business that was in the recruiting sector, and and I can tell you in vivid detail what each and every recession has felt like and been like starting with 1989. Now, at that time, I was a teenager, I was a kid, but I remember the impact that had on my parents. And so when I joined the family business, that had always been a dream of mine. I'd, I remember in high school at one point, I told my mom, when I grow up, I'm going to take over the family business. And I think she panicked a little. She's like, oh, that's nice. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she talked to some of her friends and, and my, both, both my, both my parents did and, and who ran other family businesses. And they, the advice they got was you don't want to have a lucky sperm and that's just entitled to the business. You got to set some barriers to entry. So for my brother and I, the, the rules that we had were we had to have a university education. We had to work in the real world for at least four years and there had to be a job and we had to be qualified for it. And so I started my career in the software industry selling CRM, and I joined basically four years of the day in 2004. And it was timed. It, we, we were looking at a, a growth market and, and that type of set standpoint. And one of the first things I did as I rebranded that family business, and you can see behind me, there's lots and lots of books. And I remember when I went through that process that... I was reading all these books about big companies like Apple and Nike and Starbucks. And I really wished, where was the company like mine? And so to write the book, what I did is I profiled 150 companies from around the world and I combined it with my own story to create what I felt was a practical tool that we could use and refer to. You may not read it cover to cover, but you can go and pull out different pieces. And, and so the idea behind it is, how do you grow your business and brand and any business of any size can grow a sticky brand to me it's about creating that first choice advantage how do you get your customers to know you like you and trust you and when your customers know you like you and trust you they'll choose you first and so that's the the underpinning philosophy of it but i'd be curious just from everyone today who's been reading it what stands out for you if there's questions that you'd like me to answer i'm happy to but it's i'm curious what stood out for you in your own reading um well personally uh my mom's an entrepreneur and it, it definitely encouraged me to be an entrepreneur and it sounded like you know reading through it it was interesting to see your goal was always to to take over the family business and i uh, i remember the specific part of the book where um essentially you you were starting the business and you were trying to rebrand it right you were trying to like to go after a different demographic and everything like that mm -hmm. and they were really calm 
when <laughs> when it didn't just like explode, right? Like you expected a, a really big change uh, pretty immediately. And I think I, I deal with that myself as I try to, to launch my business. Every new launch and every new product I think is going to be the, the thing that puts me over the edge and everything like that. Um, but it sounds like it's a much more patient game, um, which is tough because that's not that's not what sells people on entrepreneurial pursuits, right? Like entrepreneurial people are movers and shakers. So um, I think it was a really good reminder. I think patience um, as a virtue for an entrepreneur was was really what stood out to me the most. It's a marathon, not a sprint. Right. That's and then there was a chapter on tilting the odds require sacrifice. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, I know an awful, I, we meet a lot of companies who can't go through that for one reason or another. Uh, we've been through it several times to uh, have minimal revenues in order to function and jump or drive or grow forward. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, that's a tough one for new entrepreneurs to understand. Yeah, it's making those choices. It's tough for established businesses too, because uh, if you think of the revenue plateaus I talked about in the twelfth principle, in order to grow your business, there's natural plateaus: one million, five million, ten, twenty-five, fifty, a hundred, etc. And at each stage, you're building for that next level. But to do that requires a sacrifice. Uh, I can give you a quick story on this. Could, it might reinforce what, what you're saying, John. A company I've worked with for several years is a, a Canadian company called Central Smith. And if you've eaten ice cream in any Canadian restaurant, well, chances are you've eaten their ice cream. They're one of the largest uh, uh, manufacturers for the food services sector. Now, when I started working with them in 2016, they had... I believe nine market segments that they were targeting and we did the math. So the question was, how do we grow the company? And and 80% of their marketing dollars went into scoop shops because that was the most visible area of marketing. That's where they had their major competitors like Quarth the Dairy and Chapman's and Nielsen and all these other uh, uh, Canadian ice cream brands. And the problem was when we did the math, that revenue accounted for 0.7% of the total all revenue. So d- doubling that business didn't matter, but it took the lion's share of our dollars. And so in 16, we repositioned the brand to focus on food services and co-packing. Mm-hmm. Now, through the pandemic, uh, taking that they were significant in the restaurant trade, that business went poof. It basically disappeared on in March of 2020 yeah. with every restaurant being closed. But the I, interesting part was the co-packing side grew by about five times. And so with that, we, we doubled down again onto co-packing. Now, Within these types of sacrifices, sometimes they're they're more emotional than spending money. In order to grow the next level, we had to make another set of choices. And we actually segmented their, their customers into fish. So we called them whales, tuna, salmon, <laughs> goldfish, and narwhals. Nice. <laughs> so a whale was any customer that had over 2 million units a year. Uh, a tuna was... 500,000 units to 2 million. A salmon was one day on the line, which was 67,000 units. A goldfish was anything below that. And a narwhal was basically unicorn services, a fish with a a horn. So those were (laughs) professional services. The sales reps up until this point had always said their minimum size order was 10,000. And it was based on how many cups they could get from the, the packaging distributors. And What we had to change them by doing the segmentation was to say our minimum was 67,000. And the sales guys fought that tooth and nail. We're like, I just found the greatest brand. They are so awesome, blah, blah, blah. It's, and they would just take a big retailer, whoever it is. And they'd be, and the owner would be like, it's cool. How many units? Oh, 14,000. No. And every time the sales were here, no, no. And that's a $80,000 deal. That's a $150,000 deal. No, too small. In order to get to the next level from where they were, we had to set our minimums. Uh, And that was culturally fought tooth and nail. So when you choose, uh, when you make a choice to 
differentiate when you make a choice to tilt the odds in your favor it means saying no to other things and it means sometimes abandoning customers and markets that you were really good at mm-hmm. so that's the, and that you the really hard enjoy. Part of this. right that's true that's absolutely true and sometimes it's things that 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 you really enjoy about your business and you know i think that's the important thing is that you know you have to have a balance between um what makes you money and what keeps you turned on um you know because people aren't in aviation because I mean, there are a thousand ways that are easier to make money <laughs> <laughs> besides aviation. They always say, you know, the best way to make money in aviation or to make a million, to become a millionaire in aviation is to be, go in as a billionaire. Gotcha. But, um, you know, that's just one of the old sayings about this. But I just wanted to tell you, we have read so many books on branding in this book club in the last couple of years. Wow. Um, you know, and they are all good for different reasons. Well, all of these are good for different reasons. <laughs> um, but I really did enjoy yours. And I think, you know, it was probably the most readable and practical of the bunch. Um, I don't know if you would agree, Mickey or, or, or John, or, you know, I guess you've been here the longest. So. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I thought it was, uh, it was much more story based which is tough to do with a marketing book. Um, yeah. So I enjoyed that. Yeah. Well, I, well, it's not recent now. When I went through business school, the marketing approach was you assume that you're gonna, your client is going to be Coca-Cola, Pepsi, those guys, and they spend 70% of every dollar on marketing. Mm-hmm. Every dollar of revenue, 70% of it. Well, we don't do that. No. I mean, what, no company I know of does that. Mm-hmm. So that means all the marketing that they taught us in, <laughs> in business school is just out the window. And you got to start over. Right. And, and if you're Coca-Cola, this is, you know, fantastic. But if you're not Coca-Cola, it's hard to apply. Exactly. Yeah. So and how much do you spend in, in percentage of revenue on marketing? And sales and marketing group the two together. I think I'm going to go with an average for what I know about our clients um, because we're a marketing company. um, And so our clients probably spend uh, less than 20% um, on marketing and sales put together. Uh, You know, most of their capital goes into customer experience and they're depending on that for repeat business. But Tyler and Hal, maybe you have some, have a better feel for that than I do because you actually have aviation companies <laughs> or have. Hal. Yeah. I'm, I'm curious what you spend in marketing. If you're willing Zero. to share. <laughs> Zero. Oh, come on. You bought a website from us a couple of years well, ago. Yeah. Oh, I'm <laughs> <laughs> this is what a, a year or two ago. I did right? put a website together with you folks, but since then, uh, no, I mean, the only thing I pay for is business cards. I mean, my bad, I've been in the industry 40 years. <laughs> for the most part, um, it's repeat business, word of mouth. And and that I, keeps you... Of course, knock on wood. Um, yeah. You know, i got a halfway decent reputation. Yeah. But zero. I mean, I don't uh, go out and, and do any real advertising. It's just uh, sometimes I... Mm-hmm. Go to shows, you know. I missed MBAA this year because I couldn't get my wife to go with me. This is this is my stack of cards from MBAA. Wow, you, wow. you were busy. That's three days, <laughs> and you got what thirty cards there? Oh yeah, or more. Mm-hmm. So it's um, a lot of in-person marketing, um, Jeremy. To answer your question, and you know, I'd say twenty percent or less. I think Hal's. Um, been in business for a really long time and he's kind of um, an outlier. So the newer businesses are spending more, older businesses are spending less. But your time is also a cost that's not being accounted for. So Absolutely. look at so business I development, disagree. networking, time and field, that is part of your overall marketing spend, especially Travel when you're small, too. how much of your, what percentage of your time is a good indicator of, uh, of this. Mm-hmm. 
So I know we we spend more than that. We spend yeah, more than twenty percent too. Uh, oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, probably we don't spend seventy percent, but it's between fifty and seventy. Right. So if you count, um, you know, going to shows, the travel, the hotels, the restaurants, uh, you know, all of that is a marketing cost, and at least in our books, because we write it our taxes that way. Um, so, Hal, I don't know if that changes your your thinking or. Yeah, I do a lot of um, when when I was going to MBAA, like uh, Taylor said, or Tyler said, I'm sorry. Uh, you got to press the flush. You got to go shake hands and, and <laughs> know you're up there. Yeah. But, uh, what uh, the Jeremy said, as far as uh, you know, doing your own networking and that, and your time, I do a lot of that. When when. I'm a sort of a nervous Nelly. When I don't have a project for two or three weeks, I start calling people and, and trying to find new new customers on LinkedIn. Yep. And my wife and most of my colleagues are like, when are you going to slow down? Well, I'm only 65. And to me, that's, I, I'm just getting started. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Years, I've been immensely having my own company. So Mm-hmm. You know, when it gets and it's always the way when I get it when I land a project then the phone starts ringing and I need to be in three places at once mm-hmm. so I mean it's just I roll with the with the tide so to speak right right I and really it, like- and I think that makes sense right now um, I'm curious if you see it differently in your industry but what we've seen after the pandemic is a lot of the collapse of digital marketing as a as a lead generation platform and what well, the phrase we often use is marketing looks a lot more like 2005 than 2019 today. So yeah. those tactics that you're describing is, is, is something we're seeing across the board, especially with young people. Millennials are learning how to sell for the first time. They've never had to prospect. They've been spoon fed their deals their whole lives. And all of a sudden, Oh wait, I have to call a CEO. What does this mean? <laughs> how do I do that? It, yeah. It's, 101 learning it's it's crazy right and mickey and i were just having this conversation about uh you know leads falling off on a lot of the social channels and on email as well um so what do you do instead and uh you know we've been we've been going through that a little bit yeah no i uh absolutely with i think post outage to post facebook outage I feel like the ads haven't been delivering as well. That could be just like a psychological thing though, right? Because your your faith is shaken. Excuse me. I hate to to disagree. Okay. Uh, There are roughly 21 type clubs in aviation. Mm -hmm. And I've started joining everyone I can find. Mm Mm-hmm. Because these are people that have problems and they're asking their cohorts that all fly the same Bonanza, Cessna, Piper, uh, King Air, uh, uh, Citations uh, for, you know, where do I get this part? You know, where can I get this? And, you know, in the aviation maintenance, you know, I I definitely want to be, you know, a part and watching those. Uh, but conversations conversations going on daily yeah you know where can i get this where can i get a pre-buy on a 310 in oklahoma you know came up the other day where or what how should i redo my you know, whole panel and what do i do first right and uh, uh one of the questions from the book is you know do your customers choose you first you know, I love that question. And Tyler, the answer for you is because they know you and they know you know the answers, especially well, the South, <laughs> especially with, with their, I'm, you know. Yeah, I'm working with one of my <clears throat> previous customers. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been in the aviation fuel business for 28 years. Um, I've been a pilot for 55. So I provide the box into which fuel is delivered, you know, the truck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't make the fuel. I don't sell the fuel, but you know, we put it in, we put fuel in airplanes through pumping equipment tanks and that sort of thing. And one of my customers now is looking for a major maintenance issue with their two cares. Um, 
I'm going to keep the name of that customer, you know, private at oh, this point. Yeah. Um, and now I, I also made the decision not to put up a website that was bad. You know, I'm, I want Paula to do a good one once we get some funding here. And, uh, I, you know, so it's, it's yeah, it's been personal contacts going to these uh, the individual shows, the gatherings. I went to the Cirrus Gathering uh, or in Scottsdale. Uh, that could be huge, enormous, multi-million dollar contracts to update their, you know, panels. There's 3,800 Cirrus aircraft that need 2008 to 2009 that need a whole new avionics suite, $75,000. Yeah. Well, 3,800 3, aircraft in that category. That's a huge market opportunity. Yeah. And would you say that some of that comes from Facebook, like learning about those those different opportunities? Well, once we get an operation, we should, you know, I'm going to get back onto that, you know, their website, their magazine, we'll put an ad in or a news release or something to see if they, you know, They've all, 50 people have already placed orders with Avidine. Right. And they that, already recognize your name because you're the one who's answering the questions in these forums. Yeah, I was there. I was answering questions. And uh, mm -hmm. what they have to do when they place the order with the factory is list me as the installer. Yeah. And, you know, I get to say, oh, we're in tax-free New Mexico. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Even better. advantage. Good deal. Yeah. Huge advantage, you know, when you're talking this kind of money. So. Excellent. Uh, well, now, you know, Jeremy, I'm sorry. I've not read your book, but I want to. <laughs> okay. Uh, and yes, I did go to work for my father right out of college. Uh, he had just started. Uh, he bought a division away from a big company and it was six months into it. And uh, fortunately, I was able to use my business degree to straighten out the accounting and do CRM and, uh, you know, books, blog, record keeping and all kinds of stuff to help him move forward. Mm -hmm. um, now, I left him after about four years because uh, we, I wanted to keep, keep friends with my father. We had a dis <laughs> There's you know, a lot so. of family businesses in aviation, and I wish they all had the um, the barriers to entry that you set up or that you you had, Jeremy, in, in your your family. Um, Mickey and I went in completely different directions. He started his own company, but we're able to work together sometimes because we're working on the same problem. Uh, and he has a much um, different perspective because he went to school. Um, and has, is taking classes and is doing some technologies that I never heard about until he tells me about it. So, you know, it's kind of cool. Yeah, well, it, it goes both ways. There's a lot of foundational knowledge that I'm definitely lacking. So, um, you know, anytime that I come across something that I don't know, um, I can call my mom and she's already she's already seen three different variations of it. So. That's to, to my advantage as well. Right. But we don't work together because we want to stay friends. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, uh, that's everybody wins on that level for sure. Right. So I hear where you're coming from, Tyler. I can understand that totally. The other thing is I thought it was pretty amazing how much money companies are losing, according to your book, because they want to have a cup of coffee in the afternoon. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, six percent of your payrolls going out the door every day for coffee. I don't know if it, it's the same number now with COVID. It's probably higher since they're not coming to the office. Um, <laughs> it, but it was even worse, worse, you know. Coffee, it's a coffee all right. Not just coffee. It's people that back in the day that wanted a smoke break. Yeah. And because well, they take a half hour, I started going out with them on smoke breaks, and I don't smoke. Right. <laughs> the, the we actually side. got a lot done on smoke breaks. <laughs> I remember <laughs> that. Um, not smoking, you know, with people we'd go, but going out with them to have a, a conversation that um, ends up being a tangential idea that 
ends up being good for everybody. But, you know, without that serendipitous unstructured time, um, you know, I don't know that I would necessarily call that a, a, an expense. I think that's a cost of doing business, you know, an overhead that's very necessary. Well, but then you could say that about coffee too. Oh yeah. <laughs> Except that I don't know how that works because by the time it was people were taking a half hour and a coffee break, I wasn't doing that. Well, the point of the story is a brand storyline is simply a communication device to create a conversation. And that's, you think of what relationship building is, if it's the the time you, you spent, how going out and meeting people, type, time you're spending, Tyler, networking, it's, it's conversations are the root of all relationships. Mm-hmm. And in a marketing context, how can you create that at scale? Now, the best example of a brand storyline is the Dove campaign for real beauty, where they ask things like ugly spots or beauty spots, wrinkled or wonderful. It's got the these, these campaigns that have sparked a conversation. Now, if you look at everyone here, but uh, say Mickey, we probably remember Dove as the soap that floated in the bathtub, not right. as the fashion <laughs> brand it is today. So they, but they recreated that brand through conversation. And the thing is at a small business level, we can use conversations very well. So uh, Muldoon's is the coffee story. And they are at the time, they were about a $12.5 million uh, corporate coffee service. And what the campaign said was 6% of your payroll is going out for coffee every single day. Now, whether you agreed with it, disagreed with it, called BS, didn't matter. It would just simply strike that conversation up. This type of discussion of, I think it was great going out. I think the smoke break is serendipity, all that. That was the whole point of this thing. And yeah. we had a second campaign, which was on K-Cups, which we'd go into the into a, an organization and be like, oh, you use K-Cups? I didn't realize you hated the environment. And... <laughs> <laughs> and they would be shell shocked on it, but we train the sales reps to go into the sustainability officer and go like, you know, you could build like your building four times over with the amount of K cups being used here every year. And they'd be like, I didn't know. So we would actually get K cups banned and then they'd have to go back to tender and, and that would set us up, but it all started with provocative conversations. And I think that's something that we can all do. Mm-hmm. One of the tactics I used aggressively last year was um, h- how has the pandemic affected you? And our whole thing was around crisis marketing, which was, we'll show you how to recover the customers and revenue taken by COVID. And that brought on for us on average, a new customer a week through the height of the pandemic, yeah. uh, simply on the back of speaking to a conversation people needed. Yeah. I'm going to cat here now, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's this is great. A, this is the pandemic cat that uh, got adopted through this as well. Sweet. Well, you're <laughs> keeping him, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, it, well, he came as a kitten a year ago and it didn't leave. <laughs> oh, fantastic. But yeah, no, I actually, we have been encouraging a lot of pandemic stories, especially for, you know, our charter companies and others, you know, how much money are you losing um, waiting for the airlines or, you know, because your people don't want to be in the middle of that, you know, and because of all of the delays and because of all the complications and everything else, how much money are you losing because of all of the uh, the missed opportunities, you know, your salespeople mm-hmm. sitting around for a day is a cost. And, uh, you know, so that's a huge conversation that uh, people can get into uh, in pretty much any aspect of of um of aviation i don't know if if tyler or hal if you have a a story that you're using lately or if there's a something you want to share um the the trend that i'm seeing is is everybody's putting these aircraft back into service like my customers with these two aircraft sitting for three years yeah they realize that They've had a great aviation department going way back that saved them a lot of time. And now all of a sudden, you know, if they got to go from here to Washington, D.C., and the president of the the company gets stuck in Dallas for a couple of days because the cancellations or 
missed connections and you know this doesn't work and and they they go to a lot of places that are not big cities yeah. little places north dakota south dakota you know idaho um with yeah, all three their stops other, on an airline right yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> and heck you could drive there faster than sometimes you know yeah um and so, and the interesting thing is some of these companies, from what I'm hearing at, at Oshkosh and MBAA was, uh, they're putting their whole teams on the airplane, not just the CEO. Mm-hmm. I, I remember way, way, way long time ago, I, I worked for a company and they had a corporate jet, and but only Mrs. Timken could get on the jet and maybe somebody with the executive senior vice president you know, if she invited them, would go. And and I think that's not happening now. Uh, you know, the, the uh, we lived in uh, San Jose, Silicon Valley, and uh, I did a very large fuel farm for the San Jose Jet Center. Uh, this is the home of, you know, lots of big people, Apple, and you name it. But Anybody can get on those airplanes to go wherever they're going if it was an open sea. Uh, and some of them were actually running a little airliner around to a bunch of stops. You know, there was no way to go from San Jose to Boise, Idaho without three stops. Well, their airplane went directly. And yeah. So that's, that's happening. Um, and another thing happened uh, during the pandemic, some of the avionics shops, in fact, most of them were reporting record years of sales. Yeah. Because they were taking even the 210 and the 310, those smaller aircraft, and upgrading them, getting them ready to go back in, you know, to travel. Because, you know, back in the heart of that stuff, nobody wanted to get on the airlines. Yeah. And, and even now, uh, the airlines are busy. And they're busy to the point where they have no extra capacity, which is causing some of this problem. Right. Um, so what so, would you do to create like a conversation piece about that? Like what, uh, what kind of statement would you put out into the world so that your, your brand becomes top of mind? I mean, it, it sounds like all of these conversation really, yeah, pieces yeah. are timely. And so if that's what's going on in the, in the market, what would you put out? I'm not sure. You know, I'm looking for, you know, that's a very good, solid question. How do we market ourselves? Now, I'm a maintenance guy, not aircraft sales, but Mm -hmm. how you're seeing, you know, no inventory in uh, for sales of corporate jets, or at least ones that are ready to go. Now, uh, I am also seeing a Duncan came up and said, announced, oh, we did this G5, complete restore it. Um, Standard Aero has an ongoing contract with um, one of the large charter operations to restore their older Gulf streams. New paint, new interior, new, you know, the customer doesn't know the difference, yeah. you know, to get on the big jet. It's it's a Gulf stream. Okay. Who, who knows or cares if it's G4 or G5 uh, that are 20, 25 years old? Um, yeah, if they're properly maintained. And uh, this is the other thing that I saw at, at NBAA was the preponderance of new equipment, new avionics targeted to the legacy aircraft. Yeah. I mean, we're only building, what, 1,100 brand new aircraft a year? Uh, there's thousands of these aircraft out there that can be fixed up. Now, Hal, isn't it easier to sell an aircraft with a new avionics suite in it than the old mechanical gyros? Yeah. I'm I'm looking at these guys with the two kingers. Both of their aircraft have the old mechanical gyroscopic HSIs. Wow. And, and how are they going to attract pilots that used to fly behind a Garmin 1000 full screen stuff? Or you know the uh, 
Rockwell, you know, 2100, uh, 21's system. Well, it's definitely like, it's clearly your passion for sure. Like you clearly know a lot about what's going on in the industry. Um, it's just tough to, I would imagine it's tough to break that down to the people that you're trying to target. Um, so do you, do you, Jeremy, your mom have anybody, like any examples of people who are doing these conversation pieces right, right now? Jeremy's got lots, I'm sure. <laughs> In fact, yeah, there's a whole book full of them. <laughs> well, the ones right now are very much pandemic driven and supply chain driven are the two hot issues right now. Uh, and I think the route that you're looking for is what is the customer's burning need or issue? Uh, I'll give you one from the uh, the travel world a company I've worked with for a few years is called Cascadia Motivation. They're in the the loyalty rewards incentive travel space. Now, th- <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> no worries. Um, I got dogs over here, so if they start, I'll I'll, I'll break even with you here. Yeah. Don't worry. <laughs> she likes to make appearances. Uh, the uh, so Cascadia felt and challenge had the issue uh, through the pandemic where they basically lost 100% of their business. 90% of the revenue fell through last year. And that was because of the, the collapse of, of corporate well, travel. Tourists, corporate yeah. <laughs> so we tr- were able to kickstart that through, last, uh, through the summer uh, with a very simple brand storyline that said, when the world opens up, where do you want to go? And then we followed that with, did you know that 50% of group bookings are sold out for 2022 and 90% of group bookings are sold out between September and November of 2022? Do you fear missing out another year? Then we tag that with, oh, and another interesting stat is uh, rates for 2023 are up 40%. What that did was when people were not giving us the time of day to talk about anything else, the fear of missing out that FOMO story (laughs) had them buying. And for the first time in the company's history, they had customers that were buying three years of of events at one shot simply because of uh, that. The uh, So that's, uh, so when you look at this, issue. And I look at just my own travel issues right now from a business travel perspective. Uh, my cost of flying has, has doubled uh, at least. Uh, like I, I'm supposed to, I'm supposed to go to Italy. I might get canceled at this point, but i um, supposed to go to Italy in the next couple of weeks. And a uh, return ticket on coach premium was 5,500. And <laughs> there's no direct flights. I, it's like a four or five stop nonsense to get there the only way for me to get there is through new jersey um so it, it's such a or my brother lives in cincinnati there's no direct flights from toronto to cincinnati anymore i've got to fly through chicago or somewhere else and it's a freaking nightmare and it's expensive so yeah business travel to streamline process and not have to go through the COVID headaches mm-hmm. you'll catch people's attention oh yeah and then the question will be is, so you got the burning, you have the top level industry issues, supply chain is the biggest one. Um, it's on the stock market, CNBC every single day, inflation and, and supply chain issues. But what is the direct effect to your market and services? When you can connect the dots there, then people go, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. And now you've got a solution. And that's where the power really kicks into that. Right. I, I asked a couple of interesting questions at NBAA and got in a conversation with Avidine about the, the chip thing yep. and how is that affecting it? And they say, well, we got this and we designed it and we can assemble it in Florida with U.S. made chips immediately. Yeah. You place an order on Monday, it'll go out the door, newly constructed on Friday. Amazing. And I thought that was amazing. Yeah. And yeah. some of the other upgrades that, that I saw were drop-in replacements, mm-hmm. not necessarily full suites of stuff. And that was all US made US chips. Right. And buy America is a big topic right now, too. It's definitely like a, a wealth of a resource. I really enjoyed your book. I mean, I wanna I wanna leave that message before you go. So 
Is it available as an audio book? No, I have not done that yet. That's an interesting Is thing. I, somebody mm -hmm. knows that the millennials are not reading books. They're but listening. You don't have books. a YouTube channel. So, you know, you can. Oh, do you have a YouTube channel? Okay. You no, know, we just did it. We just started a podcast in uh, September. And so, the similar kind of sticky branding stories uh, are being released every other week. So, youtube.com slash sticky branding. Mm -hmm. And we'll do more of that. Um, the only reason there's no audiobook for sticky branding is. Uh, the publisher that did the book originally refused to do that. And so I had to <laughs> buy the rights back from the book uh, in 2019. And then when I was supposed to record it, the pandemic hit. So uh, it's just <laughs> keep having, it's a, it's, it's a comedy of errors, but someday they'll be there. Right. Okay. Just... I appreciate you coming and I really appreciate you. Uh sharing your your um, experience with us and i know this is not probably your usual <laughs> uh venue for a book club you know it's it's kind of specific and super niche but uh i really appreciate you taking the time with us yeah so uh, thank you very much well if anyone has a question or anything feel free to reach out to me anytime i'm on all the social networks and uh thank you for reading the book it's an honor um, yeah right. um so recently i started doing uh an ad campaign that's kind of targeted. I mean, it hopefully tells a little bit more of a story. Um, I have a, a distinguished honor grad, which is kind of how the military says um, your number one student. Um, and so I have, I, I had a student work with me for nine months. He got his uh, job of choice and everything like that. And so we had a very in-depth testimonial type thing. And so my latest ad campaign is definitely more story focused and it sounds like that's that's kind of one of the major messages of this book is keeping it um related to to a story so uh, i'm really excited to see how that does um and it's it's tough to maintain that patience right like i just released a new ad last week and it's like why don't why isn't why aren't people like throwing credit cards at me right now <laughs> um, so but yeah, so that would be that would be my relationship to to the story for sure. Uh, how about you, Mom? Um, well, I was going to to share a different story, but I think one came to mind while we were um, talking, and that is that you know talking about the driving need that people have and stuff like that. So you know, one of our clients charters small aircraft, and I know Tyler and Hal both of you occasionally work with with smaller aircraft. Um, and they have a hard time chartering these smaller aircraft sometimes because people have a little bit of trepidation about that, especially if they're a first time charter customer. Um, so, you know, the story is basically, does this small airplane make you nervous? Here are its security statistics, you know, versus this is what happens on an airline and showing some of the, the craziness that's going on with delays and, uh, you know, uh, fights and riots and all fights and riots. Yeah. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And driving to and from the airport and everything else, you know, which scares you more, <laughs> <laughs> you know, flying in a beautiful little Cirrus or, um, you know, going to the airport and getting on an airliner, you know, and I think for a lot of people, the answer to that question has changed in the last year or so. So that I think is a story that we could leverage. Um, but anyway, so that's one that came to mind while we were talking and reading. But John, you had some one of the things that changed my mind on a lot of things we've done is, you know, nowadays it takes you, you got to be, by the time you get in the car and you have to be at the airport, that's four hours before you ever get on the airplane. And then the average flight is three and a half to four hours. And then you got, what, two hours before you get out of the airport in a rental car and get to where you're going, at least to the hotel? For us, we'll drive. Mm -hmm. I mean, Southwest, well, I Southwest used to compete with people to drive. That's how they started the airline. And uh, right now, I mean, there are people, lots of people who uh, absolutely refuse airlines. They, the airline no longer is serving its function. I, I I canceled my flight on Southwest because they sent me the email saying we may not be flying, and I drove 
from Albuquerque to Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ten and a half hours. And well, it was five and a half for us, but we drove as well. <laughs> um, Hal, your corporate customers, are any of them considering instead of buying a new, a new airplane or a used airplane to restore one? Oh, yeah. there's. <clears throat> I'm getting a lot of you know feedback of folks wanting to do that. Okay. All the shops are full right now. You know, like you said uh, earlier with the, uh, <laughs> the pandemic, a lot of the avionics shops were swamped because everybody's like, oh, we're not oh, flying right now. Let's up. That's, that's one of the advantages we're going to promote since we get some funding is uh, we're open. I've got several mechanics we can bring on board. I know there's some people coming out of the military uh, that didn't come out in 2020 because they, you know, saw this, you know, the shit happening. Because <laughs> they, they, and they said, no, I'll, I'll, I'll re-up re for another couple of years. Well, <laughs> exactly. While yeah. Uncle Sam's footing the bill, you'd, uh, yeah. <laughs> at least his money's good, for sure. Um, and uh, I was just fascinated at all the stuff at, at NBAA for the legacy type aircraft. Um, we, can, we can make a new one. Out of an old one, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What do you think about the? Uh, this is probably, hopefully not too far afield. I don't remember GE or Honeywell is coming out with a, a panel now that's connected to the cloud. Oh, that's the uh, the Honeywell cloud, the new one. Now <laughs> they're they're pushing that into the rotorcraft, you know, the inner city stuff. Um, but it's supposed to be a whole new suite and is not just now Avidine stuff is only good in class one and class two aircraft, not in three and above. Well, the Honeywell is everything. Yeah, I know. Um, I ran it by a uh, 135 jock that I know and his initial reaction is I don't like this. Cloud's too insecure. And he's absolutely correct. In fact, uh, the government has canceled a Pentagon uh, a Pentagon contract with Microsoft for the cloud because the cloud's too insecure. Yeah, but uh, what's Hal, what's, what's your uh, website? Uh, it says Sapphire Aviation Solutions. .com. It's a beautiful Put website. Together by Paul and John. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. You're very welcome. Okay. My name is Mickey Gaminal with asvabdomination.com. If you need any help with the ASVAB, uh, let me be your first call. Paula Williams with ABCI. We help aviation companies sell more of their products and services. Aviationbusinessconsultants.com. John Williams, Ibid. What's she said? Tyler Hall, Shrike Eagle. Uh, aviation and you, I'm at uh, tylerhall.com uh, or Tyler, yeah, tylerhall at mac.com for email. Al Stevens with the Sapphire Aviation Solutions. I uh, can be reached at uh, on my website, sapphireaviationsolutions.com. I specialize in pre purchase inspections uh, and management from a technical standpoint. I do everything but fly. Great. Great. Thanks, guys. We'll we'll call that a wrap.